All right, good afternoon, folks. Welcome to Back to Basics Algebraic Data Types. This is part of the Back to Basics track. Um, I'm Arthur O'Dwyer. By the way, I am the chair of the Back to Basics track, so uh, I was involved with putting together the, uh, the, the track that you've seen so far, uh, and I hope you're all enjoying it. Uh, please let me know. Um, uh, t talk in the, uh, in the Slack and so on. Let us know how, how the Back to Basics track has been for you, um, especially by Friday. Um, did, did you learn things? How's it going? What could we do better? We're always trying to improve. Uh, also, I do C++ training. If you're looking for someone to train your new hires or uh, brush up on C++ uh, 17 or 20, um, you might want to get in touch with me. I also, at the end of CppCon this year, have a three-day course on um, classic STL programming. Uh, there's still time to sign up for my class if you want to do that. But today we're not going to talk about STL stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about a different part of the standard library, algebraic data types. So, uh, by the way, um, ask questions during the talk. Uh, put them in the Q&A tab. Uh, there will be question breaks. We don't get to the first one until about slide 40. I'm going to do a quick overview, um, tell you about uh, how the memory footprint of these types looks like, why you might want to use them as, as very quick motivation. I'm going to explain some terminology uh, that is common among all the algebraic data types. And then I'm going to pause and take some questions. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, common patterns that you see with, with uh, std optional, um, and then common patterns with variant and with parent tuple. And I'll take questions about those specific types um, after we've covered the type. So what do I mean when I say algebraic data types? Well, I'm talking about these four types in the standard library. Uh, std pair, std tuple, std optional, and std variant. Um, pair came in with the original STL, with Stepanov's STL, um, the original algebraic data type. Uh, tuple came in in 11, and then C17 gave us optional and variant. Uh, and variance constructors had little uh, bug fixes in C20, but uh, it's largely unchanged. Um, why do I call these four types specifically the algebraic data types? Uh, well, it's about the type's number of possible values, the size of the domain, the cardinality of the domain of the type. How many possible states does the object have? How many possible values does it have? If I look at a char, let's say an 8-bit char, uh, it has 2 to the 8th possible states that it can be in, 256 possible different values for char. Uh, if I look at the data type bool, it only has two possible values, right? True and false. It can only ever be in one of those two states. But if I put them together in a std pair, and I have a pair of a char and a bool, one next to the other, then the char can be in any of its 256 possible states. The bool can be in one of its two possible states. So the total number of possible states of a std pair of char and bool is the Cartesian product of 256 and 2. Right? There are 512 possible values that that pair can take on. It could be one and true, one and false, two and true, two and false, and so on. Right? So you count them all up, you get 512. Uh, if I have a tuple of two chars in a bool, how many possible values does it have? Well, we multiply 256 times 256 times two, and, and we get you know, 131,072. Um, so we say that pair and tuple are product types for this reason that when we are asking how many uh, values are in the domain of a pair uh, type or a tuple type, uh, we get that number by multiplying its element types sizes. Uh, if I have a pair of A and B, how many possible values does it have? Well, it's the number of possible values of an A times the number of possible values of a B. If I have a tuple of an A, a B, a C, and so on, uh, then I multiply all those sizes together, and that tells me uh, how many different possible values this tuple might take on. Right? And for this reason, we call pair and tuple product types. In memory, a pair uh, or a tuple is basically the same as the layout of a plain old data struct. Right? A pair of A and B has space for an A followed by space for a B. Uh, a tuple of A, B, and C has an A, a B, and a C, and they're all at different addresses right? um, within this the memory footprint of this class type. Notice that we're not doing any heap allocation here. The, the pair or the tuple contains the 
uh, constituent types, the element types within itself. Um, now, in real life, this uh, diagram is not right. Right? Uh, in real life, we would have some padding for alignment. Uh, the fields might be in a different order. So in fact, what you actually see, um, if you ask for the size of a pair of, let's say, A was char and B was int here, uh, so I've drawn it out so that A is, is one box and B is the size of four boxes. Um, if I have a pair of char and an int, I would expect to see three bytes of padding between the A and the B. Uh, and if I have a tuple of, let's say, uh, I think you can see my, yes, you can see my mouse pointer. Um, the A uh, is one byte, the B is four bytes, the C is two bytes. Let's say we're going to see some, you know, some bytes of padding here between the A and the B and some bytes of tail padding at the end to make the alignment come out correctly, right? So, yes, there is some padding going on here. But essentially, you get the size of a pair or a tuple by just adding up the size ofs of its constituent element types and then adjust for padding. Uh, by the way, this is libc++. This is the LLVM project's uh, standard library. If you look at the GNU standard library or the Microsoft standard library, they have the same uh, in-memory layout for pair, but they actually reverse the order of the fields in the tuple. Right? Different standard libraries are allowed to have different ABIs. Um, you can't uh, you know, have a variable in one translation unit compiled with uh, one standard library and expect to be able to use that same variable in a translation unit compiled with a different standard library. Right? You have to use the same standard library across your whole product. Um, OK, so uh, right, GCC and MSVC, they, they switch the order of the fields. Not a problem. But for pair, they always lay it out with the, the first element first and the second element second. Um, oh, by the way, uh, some hypothetical library ABI could actually save you four bytes by reordering the, uh, the elements of the tuple in uh, size order, right? Put B first and then C and then A. There's no rule against that. As far as I know, nobody does that. Um, but it would be kind of cool. Maybe uh, when someone starts a new library, we might see something like that. So a std pair of A and B is basically a struct, right? Uh, its layout is probably going to be the same on every uh, ABI, every, every library. Um, doesn't have to be, but the Standard library specifies that a std pair of A and B is basically, to a, to a first approximation, it's a simple struct, struct pair, and it has uh, the first element of the first type, and its name is first. And then it has another data member, second data member of the second type, and its name is second. Right? Uh, so the first one must be located offset zero, and then the, the second one comes somewhere after that. Um, and that's basically all that std pair is. It's, it's a struct template with two data members. The first one's named first, the second one's named second. And those, so to, to use that, you just access those members. Um, but that was just product types. There is another algebraic operation that we can use here, um, and that is addition. So if I take my char and my bool, and instead of putting them into a pair or a tuple, a product type, Suppose I put them into a variant. Now, a variant is kind of like a union. When I have a variant of char, comma, bool, that means that it can hold a char or a bool, but not both at the same time. So the variant here can hold any one of the 256 possible values of char, or it could hold true or it could hold false, the two values of bool. So to figure out how many possible states could it be in, what we do is we take those 256 possible states and add them to those two possible states, and we get 258. Right? So variant would be called a, uh, a sum type. Did we get the yes? Um, so to find the size of the domain of a variant type, that is to say a sum type, we're going to take the sum of the cardinalities of the domains of, of its alternative types. Uh, when we're talking about a variant, by the way, I'm going to try to use the phrase alternatives to describe its elements. Uh, tuples and pairs have elements. Variants have alternatives. But it means the same thing. It means the template parameters. So a variant of A and B has A plus B possible values. A variant of A, B, C, and so on. You just add up the number of possible states of each of those individual things. Because it might hold an A, it might hold a B, it might hold a C. So you add up all those possibilities. That gives you the total number of possibilities. So a variant is known as a sum type. 
So when I talk about algebraic data types, I'm talking about product types and sum types. Here's the memory layout of a sum type as opposed to a product type. So up top here, I have a tuple of A, B, and C. And again, this is our conceptual picture. I'm not worrying about uh, padding or anything here. Um, so it holds an A, and then next to it, a B, next to it, a C. Uh, variant, on the other hand, only needs to store one of its alternatives at any single time. So it can hold an A or a B or a C, and it can reuse the same memory for each of these. It lays them out basically one on top of the other, just like in a union, all at offset zero. We're all at the same offset. We don't really know what the ABI is here, but this is our conceptual picture that a tuple has an A and a B and a C next to each other. A variant has an A, a B, and a C, all living in the same place right on top of each other, mass hysteria. But this picture misses something, right? The conceptual picture on the previous slide is not quite right, and it's not just because of padding. It's because of type safety. The STL's variant is designed to be type safe. A C-style union is not type safe. It doesn't know what type it holds. Uh, when I say I have a union here that, of an int and a float, and I put 3.14 into the float member, and then I read out of the int member, that's totally fine. I mean, it's probably undefined behavior, but I don't know. Certainly don't rely on it. I get some, you know, 1 billion, some, some number that's definitely not 3.14. So, uh, this is not very type safe. I can put in a float and get out an int, and the compiler doesn't complain at me, and the runtime doesn't complain at me, and it just does garbage. Variant, on the other hand, is type safe in the C++ sense. I put a float into it, and then later I try to get out an int. We'll, we'll see the, the std get syntax um, in a few slides. Um, and when I do this, the variant knows that it does not hold an int, it holds a float. Right? So it throws an exception, just like uh, you know, if I try to access um, out of range of a vector using the vector.at uh, method, it would throw an exception. This will also throw an exception because I'm doing something that dynamically is not uh, correct. I'm trying to get out an int, and it doesn't hold an int. It holds a float right now. So I get an exception. Cool. So actually, variant also has to store, has to remember this index field that tells it which of its three alternatives, or however many alternatives, is currently active. So uh, you can access the, uh, the index. There's a getter for index. It's called index. Um, and it's a const member function that tells you which alternative is active uh, as, a, as a size t, 0, 1, or 2 in this case. 0 would mean A, 1 would mean B, uh, 2 would mean C, because that's the order of the template parameters in this case. Um, right. Finally, there's one more sum type, uh, which is actually the most useful one, in my opinion, in C++, uh, and that is optional. So like pair, optional has been optimized for certain common use cases. Uh, it only takes one template parameter. You can't have an optional of A comma B. It's just optional of A. and that can either store an A, a value of type A, or it can store the special value nullopt, which is of a special library type called std nullopt t, nullopt underscore t. Um, so it's essentially a variant of A comma nullopt t, um, but it's always that, and so it, is, it can be optimized for that. So it's also an algebraic data type. It's an algebraic expression that tells us how many possible values can an optional A store. And the answer is A plus 1. It could store an A, or it could store this extra one state that, that we have, the null opt state. Um, so optional also has to store an index field for type safety, but its index field is just a bool. It says, do I have a, uh, on this slide I'm calling it C, I suppose, uh, do I have a C inside myself, or do I have nothing? Do I have null opt? Um, the null opt does not need to be stored physically in memory. You can never get a reference to the null opt. Um, right? So it's basically just, do I have a C or not? Um, right, so an optional will tend to be smaller uh, than a variant. So some of you are probably wondering, what about std any? Right? We often hear that C++ 17 gave us optional and variant and any all in the same breath. Uh, but I'm not talking about std any in this talk uh, because it is not an algebraic data type. 
Uh, it doesn't follow any of these rules uh, of using arithmetic operations, um, products and sums, to describe its set of possible values. It, its set of possible values is anything at all that is copyable. Right? Anything that is copyable, I can store it in a std any. It is a type erasure type, similar to std function. Anything that is callable, I can store it in an appropriate std function. Um, I have a talk on type erasure. I gave it last year in the Back to Basics track. If you're interested in that, uh, check out my CppCon 2019 talk, Back to Basics Type Erasure. Um, so std any, not going to talk about it. It's type erasure. We'll see it last year. Um, but uh, because it came in at the same time, it still has some common vocabulary between std any and std variant or, or other algebraic types. So I'll try to mention um, when that comes up. So let's very quickly motivate each of four algebraic types, error, tuple, optional, and variant. Where in the standard library would I use pair? Um, the classic STL uses pair all over the place. It was uh, so important to them to have a way of referring to two things at once. Um, for example, std map uses std pair as its element type, right? Because the elements of a map are key value pairs. Um, right? You have a a key and a value, and you sort of have to put them together, and we put them together in using the std pair utility template. Um, so here, if I dereference my map.begin, that gives me an element of the map. Uh, that element is of type std pair, int, comma, int. Actually, the first int is const, but never mind that. Um, also, when I try to insert into the map, maps reject duplicates. And so there are two pieces of information that might come back from insert. Right? There's the iterator of where did you insert it um, or where was the collision, if there was a collision. And then there's a Boolean that, that says, was there a collision or not? Did you actually succeed in inserting it or did the insertion fail? Uh, that's two pieces of information that we want to get back from insert. And so uh, the standard library uses a pair uh, to simulate multiple return values, two return values at once by returning a pair. Um, std pair is also returned uh, for that same reason. Uh, when you call some algorithms, a std mismatch, equal range, uh, uninitialized move in actually returns a pair. Why not? Um, we're getting away from that in uh, C20. A lot of the new ranges algorithms return a lot of information to you, but they'll do it as a named struct type, not as a generic pair of two things, but they will actually make up their own struct type with meaningful names for the members. And I'm going to revisit that. Uh, at the very last slide says, do that. That's a good idea. So why would we use tuple? Well, since the STL uses pair to simulate returning multiple results, you might imagine returning tuple to simulate multiple results, right? If I have a function min max that takes A and B and then returns the minimum and the maximum of those two, right? Basically, it's a sorting algorithm, but not in memory. It's a register sorting algorithm. It says, uh, give me back the minimum in the first element and the maximum in the second element of the pair. Um, so if I had a three-element function, a three-argument function, min mid max, that returned me those three ints in order, right? The first element of the tuple would be the min, the second element would be the middle element, and the third element would be the max element. Um, I could do this. However, as I said, C20 moved away from doing that. They probably wouldn't even return a pair from min max. Uh, they would have a dedicated struct type, and I recommend you do the same. Uh, you could also imagine using a tuple to hold a pack of, of uh, data members or something. That's not a very back-to-basics topic. I'm not going to talk any more about that. But that is a case where you might have a bunch of stuff that you don't really know what it is, and you just stick it in a std tuple, and it just works. Um, tuple is also used very arcanely to forward sets of arguments to pairs constructor. We will see this come back later when we talk about pair and tuple um, after questions here. Um, we'll also see a couple useful idioms with std tie, um, which we'll come back to. Um, so optional, right. So that was pair and tuple. Why would we use optional? Optional is not used in the STL. There is no uh, functions in the standard library that return an optional or take optional. Um, but it is the most useful for your own code. Um, when I have a function that has a return type of std optional, that's like saying maybe. It's like saying, maybe I return uh, an answer, and maybe I don't have an answer for you, right? It's like, a, it's like nullable. If you're coming from uh, Kotlin, I guess, they have nullable things. Um, 
and a lot of languages have maybe. It's the same idea. You're saying, uh, okay, you told me to look up this name this, of this environment variable. I tried to look it up in the, in the environment, and I found it, and here is its value as a string. Or there is another alternative, which is that I didn't find it, and in that case, I'm going to return null opt. Uh, this could also be used in code bases that uh, would maybe normally throw an exception, right? I didn't find it, I'll throw an exception, but that's slow, and maybe my code base doesn't uh, like exceptions. Um, so instead, I'll return an optional, right? That allows me to just signal there was some, something went wrong, I didn't get the answer. It doesn't let me signal what it is, just either I have an answer for you or I don't. In a variable, such as a data member, uh, you can use optional to represent has no setting. That's different from set to empty, if it is different, right? So I might have inside a compiler or something, I might have uh, a getter for the include path. Uh, I have a data member here that represents the include path uh, that was given by the, uh, the programmer, right? If they provided one to me, then I put it in the include path member. But if they didn't pass dash i at all, and they didn't give me an include path, um, then in that case, I want to just use user include. Right? So I make a second variable. I say, if they gave me an include path, then I'll set has include path to true, and I'll set include path the thing they gave me, um, which might be empty. Right? Um, and if include path is false, then I'll use user include. In C17 and later, it would be idiomatic to instead use an optional string. Right? Now I can say, uh, uh, if it is null opt, which happens to be the default constructed state of an optional, by the way, it's default constructed in the disengaged state with, with no value. Uh, in that case, I'm going to use user include, but if they gave me a value, I'll store it in this optional, right? And so that's one line shorter here. It's, it's, we have a nice accessor here instead of having to use the ternary operator. Uh, it's just all around nicer to use optional to represent no setting when that's distinct from the empty state, the, the, the empty string. Optional can also be used to represent not initialized yet for types with no default constructor. This gives us the benefit of dynamic lifetime without heap usage, right? Classical C++ says the way you get dynamic object lifetime is dynamic memory allocation. Optional lets us get away from that, where before I might have said, I don't always have uh, a setting for obj. It's some complicated object. It doesn't have a default constructor. Uh, I will heap allocate one when I need it. In C++17, using optional, we can say, I may have a complicated object. I don't have one right now. I will emplace it when I need it. And there's no heap allocation involved. Um, here's the same thing in a memory footprint diagram. Here, with the unique putter, this is the old style of code. Uh, I would say when it, when it is engaged, when there is a, a controlled object, then I have a pointer to it, and it's out here on the heap, and I own that object. And then when I'm done with the object, I clean it up and I set the pointer to null. Uh, that's fine, but it uses heap allocation. If I want to get away from heap allocation for the cost of making my stack size slightly bigger, right, I can store it right here on the stack. I can say uh, it is engaged, uh, true, uh, that it has a value, um, and here it is. Or uh, it's disengaged, it doesn't have a value. Um, and in both cases, there's no heap usage here. Why might I use variant? Um, I don't have any really good motivating examples for variant. Um, I think that it's a relatively special purpose thing. If you need it, you probably know you need it. Um, but uh, here's an example where I have a class representing a chess move, which can be either a simple non-capturing move, a capturing move, or a castling. Um, and um, so that, in English, I said I, it's either a this, a this, or a this. So uh, in the code, I can write that out using a sum type, like variant. I can say, well, it's a variant of a simple, a capture, or a castle. Um, and then I can have these getters uh, here just showing that I can figure out um, whether it has a simple, a capture, or a castle inside itself based on the index accessor. I don't have to have a separate tag that tells me because the variant is type safe and the variant remembers what was put in it last. Um, 
So yes, I, I could open code this using a, a union uh, and a little tag at the top, um, but Variant does all that hard work for me. Um, so that's nice. So now you know how they look in memory and have some general motivation for them. Let's talk about the C++ side of things. Let's talk about common concepts and vocabulary. Um, but also, I think there are some Q&A. Even though we're not up to a question slide, uh, I will take a little look here. And someone asks, is a pair superior to a tuple of length 2? Is there a reason for me to use std pair of AB over std tuple of AB? Uh, and I would say, uh, no, neither is better than the other. Um, uh, obviously, if you don't know how many elements you have, right? If, if it's like a pack coming in, you have to use tuple. Uh, if you know that you have exactly two, uh, it really doesn't matter whether you use pair or tuple. Uh, they behave very similarly, as we're about to see. Um, uh, someone says a uh, variant has a performance penalty uh, relative to union. Um, yes, it totally does. Uh, and we actually kind of saw that on that slide that had the memory layout, right? The, uh, the memory layout of a variant versus optional versus a union. The variant has, uh, it's going to be, you know, at least four bytes bigger because it has that index field. A union won't have that index field. Um, so, you know, it has, it has to maintain that. I wouldn't expect there to be any super big performance difference um, not attributable in some way to that uh, or to just, you know, variant having a lot of... Uh, member functions, helper functions, uh, you might pay an abstraction penalty if you're compiling in debug mode. Right? You need the inliner really to get rid of some of that library cruft. Uh, you need the inliner turned on. You need optimizations turned on. That's true for anything, though. right? That's true for vector. Right? The point of variant is it does all the work for you, just like vector. Right? Uh, you don't have to write it yourself. Um, there's a question about pragma pack that I think I'm going to come back to. Um, but the short answer is I don't know. Um, and there's a question about a std variant versus boost variant and a Qt Q variant. Um, and uh, I know boost variant can be recursive, uh, which I'm not going to talk about in this talk. Um, I don't know anything about Q variant. Um, right. Oops. I was looking for my question slide and forgot that I did not do a question slide yet. All right. So let's talk about some of this um, common vocabulary. So we have uh, these two words, which I have already used, engaged and disengaged. Um, these are, I think, not terms you'll find in the standard, but they're common uh, when you're talking about optional-like types. An optional which holds a value is often said to be engaged. An optional which is empty is said to be disengaged. Um, these terms are not relevant to any of the other algebraic data types, just to optional, um, but they're very useful. You know, if you if uh, you know a coworker says uh, this optional is disengaged, now you know what that means. It means it's empty. It's null opt. Um, you can test the engagedness of an optional uh, by asking it, uh, "Do you have a value? Uh, o dot has value where O is an optional. That member function will give you back a bool um, that says whether it has a value." Uh, optionals are also uh, explicitly convertible to bool, so you can test them uh, in an if statement. Right? Here I'm using my getN function that we saw in the previous slide that returns an optional. I'm storing its return value, the, the thing of type std optional of std string, into O, and I'm using this uh, declaration inside an if condition uh, to test O at the same time. Or once I already have O in scope, I can just say if O. That means the same thing as if O has value. Um, by the way, there are some other types uh, that are not optional but have this same uh, nullable idea where they're not pointers, but they, uh, they own some unique resource and they tend to have some disengaged state. Uh, type erase types like std any and std function um, uh, tend to have a disengaged state. I can have a disengaged std uh, any. Um, and I can find out if it's in that state by asking it, do you have a value? Dot has value. That's exactly the same spelling that I would use with an optional. Uh, std function uh, does not have a has value method, but it is implicitly or explicitly convertible to bool. Um, so optional actually supports both of those, right? It was added after those, and they just said, okay, we'll just do both. And you can use either one that you want. Um, 
Other uh, types which are unique resources include uh, future, unique lock, uh, promise, thread. Uh, those could all be in a state uh, where they do not actually have the resource at the moment. Uh, and you might refer to one of them as being disengaged uh, in that context. Another verb that you'll see that came in with C11 was emplace. You can think of a variant or an optional as a buffer that may or may not hold a value of some given type. And if you want to put an object into it, into that buffer, you call that emplacing. Uh, we can explicitly emplace an object in the buffer the same way we might emplace an element into a STL container, like a vector or a set. Right? When I say vector of string dot emplace back, and then I give it some arguments, these arguments get perfectly forwarded to the constructor of string in this case, and I construct a new string with these exact arguments as they were perfectly forwarded. And that creates a new object. Um, in the case of vector, it creates a new object at the end of the container. Right? It doesn't overwrite anything. It makes the container bigger. In the case of optional and variant, we're emplacing directly into the buffer inside the object itself. And that means we have to kick out the old value before we can construct the new one. So when I emplace into an optional string, that will call strings destructor to destroy the string that was already there, if there was one there, if it was engaged. If it was disengaged, nothing happens. And then it will construct a new string, perfectly forwarding these arguments to the constructor of string. If I have a variant of string and int, uh, I can say emplace, but now I have to pass a template argument. You see this template argument down here um, that says, which alternative do I want to emplace, the int or the string? Um, and again, those arguments are going to be perfectly forwarded to the initialization of the string member. Uh, and no matter what was there before, whether it was an int or a string, it will be destroyed. It will be destroyed first, and then we'll emplace over it. To construct a variant or optional with an object already in place, you have two options. Um, so the easy option, the basic option, the one that's appropriate for the back to basics track, is just use the equal sign, right? Simple. Um, or direct initialization if you like the curly brackets. I don't, I like the, the equal sign. Um, so they're all implicitly convertible from their alternative type. So I can say I have an optional string initialized with foo, that does the obvious thing. I have a variant of int and string initialized with foo, that does the obvious thing. It initializes the string member with foo. Um, by the way, that this line I know is very close to an example that did the wrong thing in C17. Uh, and is related to why the constructor overload set changed a teeny little bit in C20. They had to do a little bug fix. I think the, uh, the problem there was if this was a variant of bool and string, uh, this char pointer would rather convert to a bool than a std string. They fixed that. That's not a problem anymore. Um, so, generally speaking, the implicit conversion here from the alternative type will work absolutely fine. The only place it wouldn't work is if the stored type is not movable. If I have some complicated type that does not have a copy constructor or a move constructor, then I can't get it from the right-hand side of the equal sign over into the, the spot in the variant it needs to go. In that case, uh, we do have what's called an in-place constructor for both optional and variant. When I construct an optional, uh, I can construct it uh, passing the constructor the special tag std in place. This is just a global variable of some empty struct tag type. Um, what else works this way? Um, sort of like true type and false type, if you're familiar with them. It, it's the same kind of idea. It's a tag type um, where its only purpose is to be a unique type that we can recognize, ah, oh, they passed me std in place. And what that means is that I should take all of the other arguments here and perfectly forward them onto the constructor and construct that string in place. The string never exists anywhere except in the buffer of this specific optional O2. Um, similarly, uh, with V2 here, I'm using uh, the special tag in place type of std string. Uh, and these arguments get perfectly forwarded onto the constructor of string. Uh, here again, in place index of one. So I can uh, construct, I can in place either using the name of the type, if it is unique, or the index of the alternative. So uh, zero would refer to int, one would refer to string. Um, by the way, this same 
uh, set of vocabulary is also used by Stid Any. I told you I would come back to Stid Any when it was appropriate. Um, so even though Stid Any is not an algebraic type, it shares this vocabulary. I can in place construct an any using the in place type or in place in or sorry not in place index because any doesn't have indices right it doesn't have template parameters but I can say I want to in place construct a string uh, or I want to destroy what was already there and in place a string instead uh, so uh, std get std get is vocabulary that means map an index to a value. You can think of a pair, tuple, or array as a mapping from an index to a value, where the index is in the range zero up to however many uh, t's are in the uh, template parameter list. Uh, so you use std get of index to extract the index, the value. Here I have a pair of an int and a bool. The zeroth argument is int. Element type. The first element type is bool. So when I say std get of zero from p, that's a synonym for get me the first thing, which in pair specifically, I can also refer to as p dot first. Uh, here, I'm using it as an L value. I'm saying assign into p dot second uh, the value false. Totally fine. Um, it sort of forwards on the value category of the thing uh, that you pass to it. So this is perfectly fine to appear on the left-hand side of an equal sign. Uh, I can also use it for std array. I can also use it for std tuple. Um, std get works for all of these. Variant also has a std get. So variant has a std get, but it's only a partial mapping, right? You try to get the zeroth element of this variant, and it says, okay, no problem, that is the active alternative. I have a zeroth alternative to give you. If I try to get at the string member, though, uh, that will throw an exception of types did bad variant access. Uh, and if I try to get at something that just flat out never exists, you know, at compile time, I would get a compile time error that says that's just ill-formed. You can't do that. Um, so again, using std get, variant remains type safe. It does not allow me access to alternatives that don't exist, unlike union. Std get can also map a type to a value. I can say get me the int member, get me the string member. Um, that works out very easily. The, the implementation is just that there are two overloads of std get in the standard library. There's one that takes a size t, and there's a separate one that takes a class uh, or a, a type name. And uh, you know, it can tell whether you're passing a type name or a, uh, or a value. So uh, all of these things are easy to include and declare. Uh, for the ones that look like sequences, you just use uh, brace initializer sequences. Uh, for the ones that behave like values, like optional, I can just say I have an optional int initialized with nine, no problem. I can initialize it with null opt, no problem. Uh, for a variant, I can say here's a char, put it in this variant which can hold chars, no problem. Easy peasy. Uh, they all also support CTAD, uh, that is a uh, uh, class template argument deduction, uh, which came in in C17. We're not really going to talk about that. Back to basics, I recommend you stay away from it. Um, they all have recursive default construction. Um, they uh, construct their members. So if I have a pair of string and int and I default construct it, that default constructs the string and the int. Um, and when I say default construct, I really mean value initialize. They come out with zero. Uh, tuple, we value initialize the int, we value initialize the char. With optional, optional is special. It does not give me an int with value zero. Instead, it gives me disengaged. Um, it gives me null opt. And with a variant, a default constructed variant uh, value initializes its first alternative, the int. This will give me an int with value zero. Um, they also, besides default construction, they all inherit special member functions from their constituent types in the natural way. So uh, a tuple of ABC is going to be copy constructible only if A and B and C are all copy constructible. If any one of them isn't, then it won't be copy constructible. It'll be move constructible unless one of its alternatives is not move constructible. Um, same for assignment operators, same for default construction, except for the caveats we saw in the previous slide. For a variant, it only needs to have its A alternative, its first alternative, uh, be default constructible, and that will be good enough to make the variant default constructible. Um, but in general, they inherit their special members in exactly the way you would think, and it all works out. They also all have natural comparison operators. So with pair and tuple, these are ordered sequences, right? It's a, an int and then a char or whatever. 
Um, and so we can compare them lexicographically, compare their first element. If that, if one is greater than or less than the other, we're done. If they happen to have the same first element, we go on and compare their second element. And we keep going until we run out of elements. Um, so that's called lexicographical comparison. Um, optional is inherits comparison from T. It works just like comparing two T values. Um, null opt compares less than anything else. Um, variant. Uh, compares lexicographically, if you sort of look at it sideways, you can think of it as either an ordered sequence of two values. First, you compare which alternative is active. Right? If, if my variant, if the left-hand variant is uh, alternative one and the other one is alternative three, well, one is less than three, so this variant is less than that variant. Um, if they have the same active index, then you go and you look at the values. So. Uh, so all of these things, the reason that they have comparison operators is so that we can use them as keys in sets and maps uh, so that we can sort them, you know, in, in preparation for uniquing them or something like that, right? They, they play very well with the STL algorithms and containers. And if you want to learn more about STL algorithms and containers, have I got a class for you. Um, so now we're finally up to the first question slide with like 15 minutes left in the talk. Wow. Um, uh, I think we've actually answered one of these questions, the, the guaranteed way to construct an object in place in the optional. Um, are there any gotchas for trying to use variant as a substitute for expected? Um, not specifically, but it's not very ergonomic. Uh, I actually had a bonus slide on that. Um, I think I'm going to go on because we have 17 minutes left in the talk according to my timer. So let's talk a little bit more about optional. So recall that an optional T is a type that we use when we mean either we have a value of type T or we have nothing. So you'll see this used a lot in business logic. This is the most useful type for most purposes of all the types we're talking about. It gives us distinct states for the user didn't give me a password and they gave me a password, which is the empty string. Right? Uh, or for a non-default constructible type, um, when I say a certificate maybe doesn't have a default constructor. But if I stick it in an optional, now the optional is default constructible. It constructs to the disengaged state. And when I have a certificate to put in it, that's when I emplace the certificate. Right? So, it, so it gets around the fact that this type is not default constructible. It gives us a state for, for I don't have one. Um, someone asks, are two disengaged optionals equal? Yes, they are. Null opt equals null opt. Um, and what's the difference between make optional and the previously shown stood in place constructor? Um, personally, I would stay away from make optional. Um, I am not sure that it has a, a benefit. Um, but I, I think the short answer is there may not be a difference. Um, um, I suppose if I had a vector of optionals, I could emplace back into that vector of optionals using the in-place constructor um, by passing std in place as the first argument to emplace back. Um, I could not emplace in, in place using make optional, because that would then have to move construct an optional from the return value of make optional into the vector. Come see me at a table afterward. I, I can explain that better. Um, so using optional, uh, when we have this uh, optional certificate, and now I have my getter that says I want to get a certificate. And uh, if we have a certificate here, if cert dot has value, then return the value of that optional. Otherwise, uh, get some default certificate and return that. Right? Um, so dot value, again, if the optional is disengaged, uh, this is type safe. It will not give me garbage. It will throw an exception. Technically, this means we'd have a redundant check here. We're checking in the if, and then inside dot value, the standard library is checking again for us to see if it needs to throw an exception or not. Um, so technically, this is redundant, uh, but in practice, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, this, this will all be inlined. The compiler will eliminate the, the second check. But if you really wanted to get around that, you could use the unchecked interface. Um, this looks very much like using pointers. Um, you say, uh, if sir, this is just this uses the conversion to boolean. It's the same thing as, as dot has value. But here, where I say star cert, uh, that's using the overloaded operator star 
of the optional type. Its operator star is like dot value, but if it is disengaged, then you get undefined behavior, just like dereferencing a null pointer or uh, you know, using an, uh, square brackets on a vector uh, with an out of range uh, index. So the terse punctuation heavy version tends to have undefined behavior, uh, eliminates the checks. If you want the checks, you use the named accessor functions. Uh, this is consistent with the rest of the STL. Uh, even simpler, uh, I could say something like this. I could say, uh, get me the value of the cert, or if it doesn't have a value, then use get default certificate instead. Um, so this is a library provided convenience method, uh, value underscore or. Um, but watch out for side effects. If get default certificate is slow or has some uh, effect on the state of the program, here I am uncalling it in order to get argument to pass to value or. I always call get default certificate. So this is different behavior from what we saw on the previous slide, where I would only call get default certificate uh, if the cert didn't have a value. So if that matters, watch out for it. But if that doesn't matter, value war is going to be a big time saver uh, or a line of code saver. Um, so suppose I have one of these optional fields. How should I write the setter for this optional field? Um, so here I have my optional cert, and I have a set cert function. Um, I recommend that when you write a setter for an optional field, you write, uh, you know, I just take an optional by value, and then I std move it into my member using move assignment. Um, that's usually what you want. Uh, you might save a move by adding an overload that takes like a, uh, an R value to the, the element type. Uh, that might save you a move in this case. Um, don't take, when in this specific example, don't take optionals by const ref um, saying, oh, I don't need my own optional. I just need a reference to your optional, my caller's optional, because your caller probably doesn't have an optional. Right? They're probably giving you a certificate or giving you a null opt. They, they won't make an optional uh, unless they need to. So as long as an optional is getting made, uh, it probably makes sense to, to give you ownership of it and, and let you move out of it. That, that's why I say, for setters, this first option is probably what I want. Don't force your caller to create a temporary uh, that you can't modify. If they're going to create a temporary anyway, let me modify it. All right, you can also use optional for optional parameters. Um, so you can write a signature, something like this. I can say uh, open connection to this host, um, and maybe it's going to use a secure you know, certificate, maybe it's not. So this function with the default uh, function argument allows me to say uh, open a connection to example.com using the specific certificate or using no certificate, or I could pass null opt explicitly and that also works because null opt is convertible to std optional of any type. So this might be exactly what you're looking for. Personally, I never use default arguments. I say don't use them. Um, and so I would expect one of two things to be true about uh, any, any place where you wanted an optional parameter like this. Either we're using optional cert as the vocabulary type across my entire product to mean maybe a certificate, maybe not, in which case... Uh, the caller already has a maybe certificate, maybe not, they got from someone else, and they are just forwarding along to me, and I forward along to someone else. And everyone in the code base understands that this is the type we're using whenever we have a maybe certificate, maybe not. In that case, that would be a great place to use a, a const reference to say, I bet you have an optional, just give me a, a reference to that. Um, or else, I have two very different functionalities here. I have create a secure connection and create an insecure connection. And I never want to be able to mix those up by accidentally forgetting an argument. Right? I want to give those different names and have them not be in the same overload set. And for that, I would write two different signatures and I'd give them two different names as shown at the bottom of this slide. Um, so if you're using optionals for parameters, my feeling is reconsider. And with that, we're up to questions on optional. Um, since I know there's a little bit of the delay, I am going to uh, move on, but feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A tab. Let's talk about variant. Detect the active alternative of a variant. Uh, we've already said there's an index method that gives you the active index as a size t. Um, there is also a free function std holds alternative. I've never seen a use for this. It's very verbose. Um, 
there's a there's a better way to do it, which is did get if. So get if uh, returns a pointer to the specified alternative if it is active. If the alternative you have named is not active, it returns null pointer. Um, so here we have uh, trying to visit a variant of three things using index, right? If if it contains an int, do this. If it contains a double, do this. Um, this code works. It's ugly and error prone. I have to type out. There's a lot of repetition here. So a better idea is to use get if here. Um, compare get if to any cast. Remember, this is another similarity with std any. If you watch my std any talk, I talk about any cast as the go fish operation. It says, are you holding an int? And if it is, it has to give you all its ints. And if it's not, it says go fish. And you get an exception. Uh, the same thing happens with get if, except instead of getting an exception, you get a, uh, a null pointer, which you can then test because a null pointer is falsy and any other pointer is truthy. So I say get if of int of this variant. Notice I have to pass the variant by address, uh, by pointer here. Um, that will give me back an int star. If that int star is non-null, then it points to the int inside this variant, and I print it out. If it's null, I go on to my else, and I say, do you have a double for me? And if that's null, I skip here, and, and otherwise I print it out. And if it's null, I say, do you have a string for me? Uh, this should always be true, given that I don't know if the other ones were true. Hand wave. Um, so there we go. We can do this. However, we can do even better, because notice that all three of my bodies here are now basically the same thing, right? There's no difference in the spelling. And so I can wrap that up into a generic lambda that does that same shape of, of C outing the thing, whatever the thing is, right? So I parameterize this, I stick it in a generic lambda, and then I can use this helper function std visit. This is provided by the standard library. It is a free function. Uh, and what you do is you give it something that is callable with a ver or something that's callable with a anything, like a generic lambda, for example. And then you give it a variant. And internally, it will do exactly the same thing as on the previous slide. Modulo, it might do some optimizations because it's the library and it can do that. Um, so it will check the index and then it will branch to an instantiation of print me for whatever happens to be in the variant. If there's an int, it will call print me of int. If there's a double, it will call print me of double, and so on. It can do this because it knows exactly what types are possible. This is something that's not possible with std any because it's type erased, and that's why we're not talking about it. Uh, notice with std visit, the lambda comes first. Uh, standard library functions, usually when they take a callable, they take it as the last argument so that it, you can sort of put it in there and sort of overflow onto the next line. Um, with visit, it takes it first, and this is weird, but the reason it does it is that you can actually call std visit with multiple variants, and it will do the whole Cartesian product of all of these variants. You know, if, this, if the first one holds an int and the second one holds an int, do this. If it holds an int and a double, do this. If it holds a double and an int, do this. Um, and you can do this with any number of variants. So with a two-parameter lambda print us, you could call std visit of print us, comma v1, comma v2. And you can extend that to a, a three-argument lambda, four-argument lambda, and so on. Now, I did say, uh, and I said hand wave, when I, when I said that this lambda of uh, int string and uh, uh, double could only hold one of those three things. That's not true. Variants also have a state that you might refer to as disengaged, where the variant does not hold any value at all. Uh, and this is called the valueless by exception state. The reason it's called valueless by exception is that pretty much the only way you can get into it is involving exception handling. If you're not using exception handling, don't worry about this. Um, and in fact, in general, don't worry about this. This is certainly an exceptional situation, but here's how you would get into it. Um, you would say, I have a variant of two different types, both of which involve uh, dynamically allocated resources. Um, I put a unique putter into my variant, um, and then I try to emplace a string into it. Right? So this is using the oneth alternative, which is std string, and I'm trying to make a copy of string x. String x does not uh, get the small string optimization. It's too long, so this needs to do a heap allocation. That heap allocation might fail. If it fails, it throws bad alloc. Now, it fails during the construction of the string into the variant. Um, by that point, 
Remember, emplace means construct a new thing. And before I can do that, I need to kick out the old thing. So the old thing has gotten kicked out and destroyed. I have now freed that unique putter. That unique putter is gone. 127 is no longer on the heap. The variant is now empty. Now I'm trying to construct a string into it. That fails. Now I don't have a string, and I don't have a unique putter anymore because I destroyed it to make room for the string. In this situation, we say that V is valueless by exception. This is the only situation where you can get into this. Uh, in this situation, there is an accessor that will tell you that this is the, the case. Also, if you call dot index, it will give you back uh, minus one, size D of minus one, like, like the biggest possible size D. Um, uh, if this state ever happens, uh, you will get some sort of exception and you will be able to test for it here and uh, please get the variant out of that state before exiting the catch block, right? Or, or know that you're going to destroy the, the variant. Um, but you should try very hard uh, if you care about this state at all, which most people do not, but, but even if you think you do care about it, you should care about it only inside catch blocks. So, um, by the way, this is only a problem with emplace because emplace means kick out the old value before you put in the new one. Um, if you are using uh, regular old assignment, that will do the equivalent of copy and swap if it needs to to make sure you never end up in this state. And with that, questions on variant, which again, I will steamroll over because we're now at like four minutes or so. And let's talk about pair and tuple. Uh, pairs and tuples represent sequences. It makes sense to initialize them with braced initializer lists where possible. There are also two helper functions provided by the STL, std make tuple and std make pair. Um, these are regular old functions. Uh, you do not give them template Arguments, they will do template deduction and figure out that you're passing it, let's say, three ints. You want a tuple of ints. Uh, you're passing it uh, an int and a bool. You want a pair of int and bool. Um, now, what's interesting here, you can't make an optional of a reference type or a variant of a reference type, but you can make a tuple of reference types. And if you do that, so here I have a tuple of intref and intref that is initialized with reference to A and a reference to B. If you do that, the tuple assignment operator will have assign through behavior. Um, so this assigns from C and D into A and B, setting A to three and B to four. That's kind of cool. You can implicitly create a tuple of references in at least three ways. Um, one way is to use make tuple, but instead of passing it A and B, uh, you pass it reference wrappers to A and B. Make tuple will uh, generally create a tuple of values, but if you pass it reference wrappers, it will not create a tuple of reference wrappers. It will actually decay them. I call this process library decay. Uh, several things behave this way. std threads constructor comes to mind. Uh, if you pass it a reference wrapper, uh, it will decay it into an actual native language reference. Um, there's also std tie. You give it some L values. It creates you a tuple of L value references. Uh, also forward is tuple, which we'll see in a minute. Um, and in all three of these cases, um, the decal type of, of this thing is, is going to be a tuple of int refs. Um, so remember our discussion of in-place construction? Well, for pair and tuple, they have multiple elements. So this doesn't work. We have to give two or, or n constructor argument lists. So we don't just say construct me in place with this stuff forwarded to the constructor. We need to say construct me piecewise with these arguments forwarded on to the first constructor, these arguments forwarded on to the second constructor. Um, and then if this were a tuple, I could add even more. These go to the third constructor and so on. Uh, this is the reason that forward as tuple exists is for use with the piecewise construct tag uh, when you are constructing pair and tuple. Uh, very niche. We're getting close to the end. I, we're gonna go over a little bit. Uh, I hope that's okay. Uh, multiple assignment with tie. Uh, we can use assign through on tuples of references to simulate multiple assignment. So here I have an iterator named it. I have a bool named uh, inserted. And I can take the return value of set insert, uh, which remember returns us a pair of iterator comma bool. And instead of capturing that whole pair, uh, I can actually use assignment to assign it into this tuple of references. This is a tuple of uh, iterator ref bool ref. So I can assign it into this. This will assign through changing the values of my variables it and inserted and updating them 
uh, with the values of the pair on the right-hand side. So this allows us to simulate a multiple assignment. Um, the STL provides a special tag type, stidignore. We're doing a lot of tag types today. Right? Um, so there's a stidignore tag. If you tie with stidignore, uh, whatever argument is in that position on the right-hand side will not be assigned to anything. It will just be dropped on the floor. So here, I am tying together a reference to x, a reference to y, and a reference to this global variable ignore, which is of some magic type that when you assign to it, uh, it accepts whatever you give it and swallows it, and it has no effect. So here, uh, I have a function that gives me back a tuple of three things, uh, and I uh, capture two of them uh, using this multiple assignment trick, and the third one I just drop on the floor. And that's totally fine. Um, so that's neat. And that is the only reason to use stidignore, as far as I know, is in this particular idiom. It was, it was invented with this in mind. A caveat, though, on this multiple assignment, you might be thinking, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to go like rewrite my whole code base to use multiple assignment. Please don't. Please, please do not. Um, so here's an example of a pitfall that you might see with multiple assignment uh, using this trick. Uh, and that is, let's say I have x and y, and I want to exchange their values. In some languages, I could say x comma y is assigned y comma x, and that would just work. Uh, in C++, I can do something similar. I can say, uh, make me a tuple of int refs, int ref comma int ref, uh, referring to x and referring to y, and assign through to those things the values found in this tuple, which is a copy of y and a copy of x. This line happens to work fine. However, the two lines below it do not work because in both of those cases, the thing that you have here on the right-hand side is itself a tuple of references. This is saying the same thing as like assign y to x and then assign x to y, but you've already overwritten the value in, in the local variable x by the time you get to reading its value again. Uh, so neither of these things is going to do what you want. Um, the solution here is don't try to be clever. Don't overuse did tie. Uh, write one assignment for line. And of course, in this particular case, we're trying to exchange the values of x and y. We should use did swap. We shouldn't be tr trying to be clever with this at all. We should use did swap. The other thing tie is useful for besides multiple assignment is compare through. Uh, when you compare tuples of references, you're actually doing lexicographic comparison on the referred to objects. Um, so here I have a name that consists of a first name and a last name. But when I compare uh, two names for uh, less than, I want to actually compare the last name first. And I could write that out longhand. Or I could delegate the job of lexicographic comparison to Tuple, because Tuple already implements lexicographic comparison for me. What I'm going to do is create a tuple of references using stidtie. The first element of the tuple is, is my last name. The second element is my first name. And because it's a tuple of references, I'm not making copies of them. I'm just taking references to them. This is very cheap. Um, I create a tuple of references for A. I create a tuple of references for B. And then I compare them lexicographically using tuples, operator less than. This does lexicographic comparison, uh, and it does the right thing. So I like this idiom. Um, with uh, C++ 20, this idiom still applies, although you, you might change the name of this from less than to operator spaceship. You could still use this same idiom uh, to order the fields of your struct. Notice in this case, defaulting operator spaceship wouldn't actually have done the right thing because I deliberately put first name, last name in the wrong order, um, just to be sneaky on this slide. All right. Uh, so I said I'd get back to this. Tuple is not that great for public APIs. If you have a function that returns three pieces of information, uh, or even two, um, don't just wrap them up in a pair or a tuple. Um, here I have a function, generate default cert, that returns a host name, a certificate, and a time to live, all uh, three pieces of information. Um, and someone might say, I should, um, you know, I have three pieces to return, I'll just put them all in a, in a tuple, and I'll return it like that. And then if you want to get out the uh, host name, uh, you just, you know, the host name is the first thing in the tuple, no problem. Please don't do this, though. This is so ugly, right? To have to say get zero and know that that means the string member, the host name member, that, that, that seems awful. And it would be much better 
to just go ahead and make a named struct, give it uh, meaningful values for each of its uh, members. Uh, this also gives you somewhere to hang uh, special uh, member functions. If uh, you decide that you need a member function for like the TTL has expired, you don't have to actually fetch out the the double. You, like you're on your way to class based design here. This is great. Um, so I, I highly recommend named types over tuples. Um, you know, don't get carried away with this stuff. I showed you how to use it, but use it wisely. Um, so in conclusion, use optional for maybe a T or for a dynamic lifetime. It's not a T yet, but it might be soon, or it was. Uh, that's a good case for std optional. Uh, pair and tuple, mostly used for implementation details, prefer to use named classes um, in multiple interfaces. Um, remember that it is possible to construct these things in place using the in place and piecewise construct tags. Um, don't overuse those. Normally, you don't need it. Um, but if you find yourself dealing with immovable types, uh, types without move constructors, remember that these things exist and they are possible to use. Uh, remember, if you have a std variant, uh, you probably are going to use std visit at some point. Um, and uh, if you have a variant, uh, know that valueless by exception is a thing, but also know that you don't have to worry about it. Right? it it's a, a very rare case uh, if you're in the back-to-basics track. Um, don't go out of your way to, to try to figure out what to do about it, because the right answer is, it's just going to work. Don't worry about it. Um, and with that, we are finally done. I'm sure we're a little bit over time. Uh, I would still like to take some questions if we can, uh, Nikhil, if that's cool and if there are any questions. Um, it looks like there were a couple. Um, so if one of the variant alternatives is not implicitly convertible to a string, will it fail at compile time? Um, in, the, ah, in that case back there where we were printing out um, the bits of a tuple, this, this bit. Yeah, so here... Uh, the compiler will be instantiating that generic lambda for every one of the types in the variant. And if the body of the lambda uh, doesn't compile for one of those types, then uh, you get some crazy template error message, yes. Um, so you want to, you could use if const expert or, or a requires clause or something to, to try to, to work around that if you had that situation. Um, and what would I recommend for optional parameters, if not optional T? Um, Pretty much, I don't think I have anything really to say with that other than uh, that one slide that, that gave some options here. Um, so either there's a situation where optional T is fine, but you probably want to take it by const reference because someone else has an optional and you just want to view their optional. Um, or they don't have an optional and they really just have two different things that they're trying to do. One is they want to pass the argument. The other is they don't want to pass the argument. And I wouldn't want to give those two things the same signature so that someone could accidentally forget the argument. I'd rather give them different signatures. Um, so in general, where people think they want optional parameters, um, I think quite often uh, they probably don't. Um, I'm just checking the Q&A tab here. Are make pair, make tuple still useful with CTAD? Um, if you're in C++ um, 17 and you have class template argument deduction, should you use std make pair of some stuff or should you use std pair of some stuff? Um, and there is one thing that make, make pair and make tuple do, which the CTAD version does not. If I just said here std tuple of std ref and std ref, I would get a tuple of reference wrappers, which is not what I want. That would not do a sign through. Uh, if I want to make a tuple of references, I should use make tuple uh, with std ref like this. Um, in general, that would probably work fine. Um, I'm not a huge fan of CTAD. We can take that offline. Um, but that is the one big difference, is if you're using std ref, in the one case with ctad, you will get reference wrappers. In the case that you use make tuple, it will do library decay, um, or make pair will do library decay and will give you references. Um, cool. I see no further questions. So I think thank you for coming. Enjoy the Back to Basics track. Uh, come to my class. I'm Arthur Edwire. <laughs>